I think Monaghan people might, might argue two minutes was more than adequate to cover the injury and the substitutions. You can't add pain for booking players. That's part of the game. It's part of the game. I'm not finished yet. It took me a long time to get here. Both players have, have spoken with each other. There's only one place to start today, lads, and that's David Clifford, second Jella Clare. Poor David Clifford. He was distraught. No, no, are you serious? He says to the re- he's saying to the referee and maybe a couple more little things as he's passing the, the umpire. So it's very obvious what happened here to me. Uh, you've Ben McDonald coming in and he roughs David Clifford up. David Clifford and him go to ground. David Clifford's hands go out. He doesn't want any part of it. David Clifford's already on a yellow card. He has no motivation to get involved in this shit. What's his motive? Why would he want to get into this? And because he knows what referees are like. Ben McDonald has huge motivation to get in a wrestling match with David Clifford because he's not on a yellow. He's only on the field. David Clifford is. Does Ben McDonald know that? I would say yes. You know, and then you have a situation where the referee comes down. His two umpires who are standing looking at all of this and they decide to tell the referee that it's a, it's a double yellow. To be honest, you, you would just be sick of this kind of thing going on. Um, and it's not the first time it happened this weekend. Paul Mannion happened. Paul Mannion, and we I'd have a good feeling it happened. Peter Hart as well. Only that was caught on camera. It's happening. Donkey's ears, Colin. Um, but I suppose David Clifford getting sent off, being the nation's uh, sweetheart, <laughs> maybe is what he is. Is has really shone a light on it. Um, I I have a bit of experience with that myself, fully. Um, I come on as a sub against Kildare in the Lancet semi final, and. Um, I was on the field all of 10 seconds when I was sent off um, for an instance with Brian Lacey and again I just walked in handed Brian Crow who was refereeing the, the slip went up and you know um, Brian Lacey pushed out of me and I retaliated and both of us were sent off um, so I, I, I feel for, for the likes of David Clifford and I'm not saying I, you know what I done was you lamp was, Lacey yeah. did you? <laughs> well, like, doesn't well, sound like the well, same well, example well I didn't really like I was never really in trouble <laughs> myself much but um, I, I can I, I blame the officials in this this instance like there's six of them watching the game between linesmen umpires at that instance there's yeah. two umpires down the other end the referee took advice y- you know he did but but the other side of it too is management teams are uh, like like from my point of view when I was managing loud right I would be fully aware of who's in yellow cards and who's in, you're watching all that type of stuff and right and, and listen <laughs> you know it's in Tyrone's interest that he goes off the field now I'm not saying there was anything that was well, you know in the case, case, Joe, Joe Brawley is accusing the, the Tyrone management of sending Ben McDonald in to get David Clifford sent off he said scandalous behaviour by the Tyrone management we know he has an issue with Mickey Hart hmm. to, uh, scandalous behaviour by Tyrone management to get David Clifford sent off bringing on a sub to wrestle him to the ground good luck with that I would be reluctant to blame Mickey Hart to say Mickey Hart identified that. I would say this happened. No, I, I, I'd, I'd be in agreement with you 100%. There's no way when he's going in, Mickey Hart singles him out and says, listen, go in there and do what you have to do. But I would be pretty sure in the team meetings during the week that um, Clifford was a guy that had to be stopped. And um, now, you know, I'm not suggesting for one minute that they'd be saying this is what it has to happen. But like, you know, you'd be putting guys in, you'd be changing markers up, you'd be making sure that the be heat on the guy all the time yeah. and the one guy can't do that all the time because he runs into the risk of being in, in, in trouble with referees but you know for me I feel I feel sorry for David Clifford and I think there was 7 minutes injury time so he was off the field for 12 minutes 12 minutes like Kerry's you know Kerry's most dangerous forward arguably the best forward in the country at the minute and then pushing to get an equaliser so you know, the only one that wins here is Tyrone. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And, uh, but if Tyrone wanted to get David Clifford sent off, why would they not have done it a minute after he got the first yellow? Yeah. Wrestle him then. Sent Mickey Hart sent, because he was playing very well. He was the, the one carry forward that was causing Tyrone a lot of problems. Why wait till towards the end of the match to do it? That, you see, I don't really believe Mickey Hart, I don't believe Mickey Hart sent him in to do that. Ben McDonnell could easily have taught it in his own head. Exactly, yeah, and I don't think Mickey Hart would be sending in Ben McDonald to do that. Like, you know, a midfielder and an athletic player who can give them so much going forward. Like, he's not a dog to go in and mark David Clifford. Anybody could do that, and he probably just thought there's a break and play. I'm going to rough this lad up a bit, and he probably knows he's on a yellow. I don't think it was a stri- strategic thing, but what I will say is that if it was, then it's really, really bloody sad that 
they know that the referee will fall for that. Yeah, that's, that's the sad thing. Well, it's yeah. not the referee; it's the two umpires. Well, everybody, that's yeah. stupid. It does and still part of the official. Referee didn't see it. Well, the ref doesn't want to know though. Like he's yeah. just happy to give the two yellows and get him get his out from it. Yeah, but, but there's instances all throughout the weekend where there's you know there's umpires involved and and like. What's the protocol for these guys being training? Is it, you know, a local fella comes up and he says, here, geez, we're stuck for two referees on Sunday. We want you, once you can make the signals, is that, a, is that good enough to qualify you to be a, a, Well, that's the point. A, a like, they're, at the they're... end of the day, you can't blame Mickey Hart because we don't know for sure. Um, Tyrone are going to use that, I'm not saying a, a tactic to get a guy sent off, but an aggressiveness towards David Clifford in terms of how to defend, and that's how Tyrone play. But the, the one that can really sort out this problem is the officials. And, and it was farcical, you know, to make that call on David Clifford. No, it was. it was. And uh, the whole idea of appointing umpires has to be called into question. And how they can just be the, the referee's father-in-law or, yeah. you know, brother-in-law or something like that. And it could be 70 years plus and their passion is GEA and he's looking after him and it's a great day out. And they're not capable of making very obvious calls like this. And so the appointment of umpires, definitely. And like, I mean, you're talking about coming in on Lacey. I was, the, I told this story before, Con, and I hate repeating myself on stories, but when they're relevant, I was playing with Parnells against uh, Kilmuckle Croaks. And I was playing centre half forward and Keno Sullivan was centre half back for, for Kilmuckle Croaks. And I remember talking to Alan Brogan on the phone. I says, here I'm Mark O'Sullivan. And Brogan started laughing. He says, you're gone. He's too fast. He says, you won't even, even if you get past him, he'll catch up on you and he'll dispossess you. He's too good for you <laughs> at your age. Whatever like this. He, he, Alan had me convinced this lad was absolutely, he's a brilliant player and I was in my 30s. But anyway, so I got it in my head. What I'll do with this lad now is I'll get him on an early yellow and maybe that might rattle him. I'd never done this before in my life and I never did it after and I feel a little bit embarrassed about the way I carried on with Keno Sullivan but I got him the yellow after about 15 minutes I was blackguarding him I was messing at him and eventually couldn't get him to react because he's just a gentleman so I grabbed him by the jersey I pulled him down on top of me onto the ground and I held his head in a headlock and the referee came running down and the two of us got yellow cards <laughs> and I said to O'Sullivan I says you're on a yellow now you're, you're, you, you better watch yourself he continued to roast me it didn't help me in the side of, <laughs> I don't but, need the other yellow but you get, but like that, that's the point that's how easy it was for me to do it to Keno Sullivan who genuinely wanted no part of this nonsense I was going yeah. on with and it affects I don't know what, anyway I'm not getting into why I did it but it was just that easy mm. that easy to get him a yellow I'd say you're the only forward in the country who instigated one of those wrestling <laughs> matches. <laughs> yeah, and uh, usually it is the defender that instigates mm. it. But then the defender being on the yellow is worse than the forward being on the yellow, yeah. really. So, like, I don't know. I think it. I think the defender in these scenario with the Clifford, it's more motivation if you're on a yellow, you're obviously. Yellow. Do you know yeah. that kind of... I saw him and McGee on Twitter. It was funny. He says, if, or if he thought of that, he would have got the first yellow, then give Neil the wink, and Neil would have got the second, ge- got the second yeah. yellow. <laughs> Imagine trying to mark Clifford and you on a yellow. <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. So that's the thing. So you ne- you have to swap it. Or you'd have to swap it around. Like I don't know. Are we overthinking what a management team might think to do? Well, Tyrone did it before. <laughs> I'm not saying it was strategic, but uh, against Derry, uh, Cahill McCarran got Emmett McGuckin in the headlock, and McGuckin got sent off for it as well. Do you know? Um, maybe they're just cute uh, as a people. Like you know, I'm not saying that Mickey Hart knew what he was doing, but they've done this before. Yeah. Well, look, you have to keep changing it up because the one cornerback. It's going to be a third time for him. If, if Kerry have a level f- share of possession coming out of the middle of the field, it's going to be a third time for Connor back to try and mar- mark David Clifford. So it makes sense to, to you know, like you could get be done for nothing, only persistent fouling where he wins three balls. He's taking you on. You have to, you know, you have to do something to, to stop him and persistent fouling. You're on a yellow. Then what do you do? You have to change him up. So I wouldn't read too much into it. The fact that, you know, Mickey Hart sends guys out to do that. I, I, Look, Brawley just is a thing with Tyrone. And, and look, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be the biggest fan of Tyrone, <laughs> Tyrone myself. Do you know what I mean? They have produced some fantastic players, but just the style of play wouldn't be for me. But um, it's it's just impossible all the time to mark someone like David Clifford without, at some stage, being put under pressure and, and possibly taking the yellow card. Yeah, no, definitely. Right, to get an idea of what it's like for referees... Um, you know, in situations like this, um, we have Pat McEnany join us on the line now. Pat's obviously a former referee and GA referees chairman. Um, how's it going, Pat? Good, good, yeah. Still alive and kicking, and um, 
you know, reasonably happy with the performance on Saturday night. So yeah, the weekend's been quite good. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, we'll get to that in in a second. I want to start off with the big one, I suppose, and the one that people are up in arms about, and that is David Clifford getting a second yellow um, yesterday. So, like, I mean, what's your take on this? It's it's. I don't think it's up for debate that David Clifford didn't really deserve a yellow card yesterday. A second um, yellow. I think that's a bit harsh, maybe, or a bit uh, too clear cut from. Uh, sorry, excuse me, from what we've seen on television. I think the TV cameras um, <clears throat> came in. Maybe, possibly, we didn't see the start of it. I think we've got to accept that that we didn't see the actual start of it. But what the TV cameras did catch didn't reflect too well on the umpire's decision. Let's yeah. be clear about that one. What we seen on. On, on camera did not reflect well on the umpire. But, I think maybe Kieran Whelan mm-hmm. was a bit harsh on the referee. So it was a it was a terrible decision. I think maybe it's what he described the referee. But he, he was he was purely relying on his umpire. Yeah. And um, you know, if what we've seen on um, on TV is exactly what happened and that nothing happened prior to that. Then it looked a very poor call. Let's be let's be clear on that. Because that's the thing. Even if we didn't see the start of it, we've seen these kind of things a hundred and one times. And David Clifford's <clears> on a yellow. David Clifford's a forward. He's no motive. What's David Clifford's motivation to get involved in anything like that? You know, there, there isn't any motive there. Where there's a huge motive for the the defender. Yes, and that's that's fairly accurate. I have to say, but. Uh, you know, if, if I go back on my refereeing career, there was a couple of forwards, and maybe you were included in that, who were <laughs> quite capable of handling themselves. And, uh, you know, if I think of even the, one of the greatest is in Peter Canavan, I don't know how many times I've booked him. You know, like, um, you know, corner forwards nowadays and full, they're quite capable of looking after themselves. But, you know, I think th- this came up uh, three or four, I remember when I was chairman, and even when I was referee, and we went through spades of this where where umpires and linesmen were making a very easy decision and just book both players and over and out. And, and it wasn't acceptable at the time and it's not acceptable now. And really what you have to need to look at is who is the aggressor? Who is the Who starts the aggression? Yeah. And that's the player that we need dealt with. And I think, you know, when, 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 when the committee review, I have no doubt when, when they review, because there has been a couple, you know, if I look at the game on Monday, on Saturday night, um, a young Duffy O'Connor back and Mangan from Dublin yeah. both players were booked and I'm going did Mangan deserve a yellow card in that scenario I'm not sure he did um, so I think there will be a bit of pressure on you know to review some of these incidents and go you know we want the prepper here we want the guy who started and and while the the offender who maybe gets involved like Clifford got involved in that wraparound last night you know, if he doesn't draw a box or he doesn't do anything silly, then all we're looking for is the guy that started. Let's have him a yellow card or a red card or whatever that card is. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And like, I mean, to take the motivation away from the defender trying to get the other player a yellow card, should two lads just rolling around the ground even warrant a yellow? Like, maybe the best thing to do is just tell them to get up altogether and stop that, stop messing. Well, I think you know what. Yes, I think that, you know there's a clear instruction, and it wouldn't have been changed. You know, um, any. Two lads rolling around on the ground. Uh, the referee is on the clearance subject. I know he was back when I was involved and when I was chairman. Two fellas rolling around the ground and no interest in playing football. The limit, is, the minimum, is yellow card for both. Right. Okay. So tell me this now. So but, you, but the yeah. camera, the camera shot, the uh, column kind of look, you know, looking at last night, like you know, when when David Clifford went to ground, he kind of had his hands out and. Yeah. He was at the mercy of two or three. It didn't look good now. That did not no, look good. No, And it has to be pointed out, Peter Hart got a second jello as well for an incident, but we didn't see that on the camera. So this is happening uh, pretty regularly. So say you don't see an incident, um, Pat, and just like the referee yesterday, you run into your umpires. You stand, you turn around, you stand facing out the field. One umpire goes one side of you, the other umpire goes the other side of you. What do you say to them? What is the clear picture? Give, give me a clear picture of exactly what's happening here. Very simple. Right. And they explain to you exactly what has happened here. Right. And then you take action. You know, the umpire shouldn't be telling you that, you know, it's a yellow card or red card. He just tells the referee what happened in that incident. Right. And do you say who sta- do you ever say referee, do you ever say who started it? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I would have said. But you know, um, was there a mixed message between the umpire and the referee? But let's be very clear, Colm here, let's be very we did not see the start of that. You yeah. know, purely if you're in a court case and you're looking at them um, evidence, 
do we have all the evidence? And the answer is no, we yeah. don't from TV it, pictures. Yeah, I'd also but look at in the court seen, case. What I'd we've seen last night. Yeah, go on. I'd, in a court case, I'd look at motive as well. And Defender is highly motivated to get a yellow and Clifford get a yellow. And Clifford has no motivation whatsoever to be interested in that kind of stuff. That's, that'll be fair comment. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely. I I do. I I take your point, and without seeing the start, I'd be fairly sure, having not seen the start, how that started was the defender came in and got got involved with Clifford. You know, like I mean, and that yeah. that was it because you've seen but it Colin, so many times. If I came to you fifteen years ago and I put a, I stuck a red card in front of you, and I'm going, I'm fairly sure, Colm, that's not acceptable when you're a referee. Yeah. Me as a referee, I've got to be definite sure. But I suppose that's what your umpires are there for now. It is a ter- it is a ter- terrible call by them, you know, if it just took the easy way out. Because unfortunately, Pat, uh, down through the year traditionally, that is the easy option for referees, isn't it? It's the easy one just to and give that, one that each. Common. I, I, I would never use this word, a terrible call. I'd say it was a poor call. It was a poor call by the... By the but based... Based on what we've seen on TV, let's you know, let's yeah. be very clear about that. Based on what we see, and yes, I do agree. I think we need to maybe review that. As you know, I'm, I'm sure that will the group will review that and go. And we re- need to re-emphasize the point. We only need the aggressor. You know, if the other uh, the receiver ends up getting entangled and all that, then we only need the starting point dealt with. Now, but you can't have somebody. Um, you know, like, let's say if Clifford had to draw a box last night, you know, then he's got to get a straight red card. Do you understand? Yeah, but self-defence is a, is a defence in court as well, if we're going, if we're going to start. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but self-defence doesn't mean drawing a box. Like, you know, you know, it, it doesn't yet. I mean, we can't allow, if that scenario had to develop last night and David Clifford did draw a box, you can't end up not sending him off. Otherwise, then, you send out a message, well, players are going to take control of their own um, protection. You can't. Yeah. You must let the referee. You know that's the that's the ultimate responsibility of the referee. Protect the player. Okay, right. Well, Camira, I want to ask you another one now that you might be a little bit biased on, considering Banty's um, involvement and where you're from. But Monaghan, Dublin, on Saturday night, the fourth official puts up six minutes of extra time, six minutes, and he ended up playing over over nine. Nine and twenty minutes or twenty seconds. Nine minutes, twenty seconds. So he played over three minutes, over the six minutes. Now there's a breakdown on the forty-two about uh, where he might have found that extra time for. So there was a there was a booking f- with Owen Merchant and Shane Carey for an off the ball clash. Uh, then he showed Conor McManus another yellow card for a separate incident. Um, so between when Sean Bugler scored his uh, scored a point. Until the game resumed, there was a minute and a half um, of of stoppages, or you know, time had elapsed. Then uh, Rory Began, but between the time he took to take two frees, there was another uh, minute. So it, I know that Kieran Whelan kind of agreed last night and Pat Spillane that he was right to play three minutes over the six. What's your take on that? I think you know, and, and again, you know, looking at it from a balance, you, I, I didn't have a real problem with the with the injury time, you know, I think as Seamus said afterwards, you know, uh, we, we made more mistakes than the referee did when we analysed our game and uh, down to injury time. Yes, you could argue that, you know, uh, the begging situation, like him, him, him being slower, to, that is part of playing time. So it's right. not an additional time. Okay. You know, the referee has the responsibility, he has, has the armour in his tool that if begging is, 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 um, is taking too much time to kick the ball, he just tops the free kick. It's, I mean, it, in a normal game, you don't add that time on. So okay. you can't be adding it on in injury time. Um, the only time you stop play, roughly speaking, referees add time, 30 seconds for every substitution. Yeah, there was, there was, yeah, there was two, two substitutions. So ta- there was two or three substitutions. So you add 30 seconds, right? I think Monaghan people might, might argue two minutes was more than adequate to cover the injury and the substitutions. You can't add time for booking players that's part of the game as part of the time but if you ask Pat McEnany I would go no real you know I don't have a real problem with the, the you know the one maybe small gripe I would have had was the advantage that could have been played in the last few minutes of the game where we had yeah. three players on one yeah. uh, and that was a big call in the game you know we, we made a couple of mistakes you know Drew would you know when, when we reviewed the game Drew Wiley you know give a silly free away us coming out with possession and he fouled the man 
um, you know, Rory will be disappointed that he came for one ball, dropped it. The goal that we conceded was, you know, was, as we would call it up here, was a jammy enough goal if we shouldn't have conceded. So when you take all that into account, you know, we're, we're, we're big boys up here and we're not going to get down to whether there was a minute played over time. And I, as I always say, we should take our decisions, you know, don't hand over your decision making to the referee. Keep yeah. it in your control. And we had loads of opportunities to keep that game in our control and we just we just didn't manage it well enough. But, but, but it, just, hey, just, uh, just, think, just on the, the, the point that you made about the yellow cards, so he booked Shane Carey and Owen Merchant and Conor McManus. So this was after Bugler's point. So the, the, the play had been, there was no play wasn't going on. So by the time the ball had been kicked out again, he had booked those two players. So you're telling me that's normal play because it has to be normal play really because if you're adding three minutes onto six, that's completely disproportionate to the injury time that's put onto the 35 minutes. Absolutely. Yeah, it is very disproportionate as you would say, yes. But um, if you talk to the Monaghan camp and and, uh, I'm pretty close to it, you know, not, it's not an argument. It's not, we're, not, we're not interested. It's as simple as that, Colin. Right, right. Okay, I know you do, probably don't want to give out or, try, or find excuses. I, I can draw those conclusions that if, if, if yellow cards are part of the normal play and if taking a bit of extra time over a free is normal play and if the referee is not happy with the time wasting, he doesn't stop his watch, he throws the ball up and uh, you know what I mean? The free is, you lose the free. Yeah, you lose the free. Yeah, because that's what you do. You can't add time for a delay. Because if a player delay is taking a free kick, you're allowed. The, the, the penalty is you hop the ball. Yeah. So it's not included in extra time. Yeah. Yeah. Because at what the point? At what point do you injuries, start? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, at what time do you, do, you, do you throw the ball up? And, and 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 that's down to each individual referee. You know, what's your tolerance like? What is your tolerance when you know what's people's tolerance on thirteen steps or on thirteen meter free? What what's people's tolerance on the time it takes to kick it? to take a kick out so it, yeah. that can vary a bit free, take route, free kick routines and everything come here Pat we've gone way over time I'm going to ring you after the league and we'll get a, we'll get a bit of analysis on the sin bin it seems to be working uh, pretty well so far I don't, I don't agree with you but anyway you don't agree with me oh on Jesus oh, well, no. it's a pity we're out of time so so listen I'll get, I'll get you back <laughs> on again and we can do something on the sin bin thanks a lot Pat thanks a million cheers bud bye so that's interesting, lads, what he said about this, because I was looking at this thinking the, ec- the six extra minutes in the Monaghan game and I was looking at the stoppages um, and in the 42, they had it actually uh, chronicled exactly the minutes and the extra time and all this. And I was looking, oh, well, that looked warranted. I knew there was a good few. The play was stopped a good bit in the six minutes. So maybe it was, was warranted. But when Pat's saying that yellow cards are not extra time, and you're saying that um, somebody taking a bit longer over a free, that's not extra time. The punishment for that is to throw the ball up. That's not extra time. The only thing within that six minutes that was extra time were the substitutions and there was two of them. So, like, I mean, he did play extra time because if you look at it, like I, s- I was saying to Pat, three minutes on top of six, it's completely disproportionate to the four or five on top of 35. Like, you can't stop it for all sorts of yellow cards and things like this or we'd have 20 minutes extra time. Yeah. The only thing so I'd it was wrong. The, the referee was wrong. The, the only thing I'd say about that is that the six minutes were injury minutes. They were the minutes that weren't played over the seventy. So I don't think he should be allowed to waste any of those minutes with a with a sub or with a yellow card or taking your time over a free. I think he should be playing all those six minutes, however long it takes. That should be playing time, and if that means a stop clock just for six minutes. Then Graham, but they're the six minutes we didn't get to play. I get you, but then like I mean. It, 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 Pat McEnany is saying playing time is yellow cards. That's playing time. Or else you'd be adding extra time on for all sorts of things. Do you get me? Playing time is everything yeah. that happens within that 35 minutes. The only thing you stop for is injuries and substitutions. That's extra time. Mm. And that's more consistent with the, the time that goes on to the 35. Like if a yellow cards and all sorts of different things are, are counted as extra time, so we could have a 90 minute, <laughs> 90 minute what game. What happens in a situation where a guy is... A, 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 the fella who's getting a yellow card has actually cleaned the fella out of it. Oh, and well, the then fe- if there's an injury, then that's d- injury. D- do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, it's just a straight yellow card, a straight yellow card. I can understand that, but that shouldn't take any more than a couple of seconds to uh, administer. Do you know what I mean? It's not a case of we should have a big, long debate around the yellow card. So most of these, inf- like... Well, sometimes he's to go away, ask the linesman what happened, then give the yellow cards. 
as far as Pat McEnany, which is news to me, that's part of your normal time. The mm. clock is not stopped for that. So if you had an instance where the referee, and, and we've seen in the past where, you know, it's been farcical at times where a referee is actually looking for a fella in the field yeah. <coughs> that's committed a, a, a yellow card offence. Yeah. He's running up to umpires. He's that, running that took up a to minute and 50 he seconds. So he was looking for Merchant and McManus. Yeah. It took a minute and 50 to seconds. To me, now, look, I'm going on what Pat said here, yeah. Les. We heard what he said, but like I do take your point. That did seem like, you know... And, and then you've got the referee like I mean they, human common nature sense has thinks, to prevail here like common th- sense does but like there's also like we'll give them one more go even though the, if there was a clock up in the corner like yeah. in the ladies the mm. clock would buzz even mm. if there's a, an attack and everyone in the stadium going rooting for a team to get the equaliser because a draw would mm. be a fair result as the cliche go and the buzzer goes eh sorry yeah sorry but that's the time up one now. more next score to but the it? referees almost go like here's the kick out the time's up we'll let this die now you know yeah. what I mean they let the last attack go and sure that's old fashioned too and you're bang on about that because uh, this isn't an excuse like I, I think like there was over four minutes I, I'm sure we've all tied it up and Pat's right about the rules but the referee that's not an excuse for him because he blew it up after like three and a half extra more minutes yeah. do you know which isn't what we all counted so he was just blowing her up after Dublin got the equaliser oh, yeah. and Monaghan caught the ball. Like if he was actually doing what everybody thought he was doing, he would have played another minute on top of that. Yeah. But he didn't do that. Porrick Por- Por- Joyce was pissed off after the, the, even though they won. He said, Joe McQuillan did his best to get a draw out of the game and gave them every chance. And Joe McQuillan gave two very, very soft frees at the end of that. One was on Langan, which Thompson missed. Mm. Uh, that was Mul- Mulcairn. And the other was Paul Conroy on Ryan um, McHugh. Ryan now, McHugh pa- Paul McConroy was indisciplined. He shouldn't have put his hands near him at all, especially he, when McQuillan he, wanted, to bl- wanted to draw draw the bloody thing up. But he did nothing like Paul Con- In fairness, like, you know, if they're given a free for every yeah. instance like that throughout the game, we'd, we'd be stopping the game every two minutes. Oh, you would. Well, look, it wasn't. A, technically, he did put his hand on his hip. But look, it was the softest free as you get. It was the referee trying to draw up mm. when can we get away from that and the only thing that would stop that is is the clock up in the corner where there's no there's no ambiguity it's completely transparent everyone in the stadium knows there's 10 seconds left here absolutely it comes down it comes down again to to like the simplest simplest of facts like we need to stop clock you know like most most sports have them like like why not us yeah. Take, take and take, the ladies' game has them. Like, take I mean, it out it of the referee's well. hands. Yeah. Let the referee referee the game, and and instead of looking, you see them going out. They've, you know, they've two and three watches on them, and you know everyone like does linesmen does does, you know, watching clocks does tour officials, fourth officials. Yeah, Just and get and a stop clock. Joyce said against Monaghan they were told five minutes. This is in the first round league game, nine and a half minutes. So they added four and a half onto the five. Lads, you're looking at a 70 minute half if you're to keep that <laughs> consistent across. Now, I know mm. players act the maggot in the extra time and yeah. they go down, but that's too much. So I don't know what's happening in extra time. And there, this was a one point game as well where the referee's going, I'll give him, every, I'll give him another chance now because, geez, in fairness, now both teams played well today and every supporter in the, in the ground will come out of the game saying it wasn't a draw fair <laughs> result. I'm telling you. And Kerry against Dublin. So like, I mean, you're telling me that that game wasn't over before Clifford got the, the, the... Like, that was a Dublin win. Like, let's be honest. Like, this was... Mm. Give them one more go because a, a draw is a fair result and Kerry played very... I think referees are thinking like this and it needs to stop. Yeah, but this, this is a bugbear of mine. Though. Like, you know, if there's five minutes added on and then a team, they act the maggots and they're down for two or three minutes of that. I would hate that. I do hate when it happens that the referee blows it up on five minutes then. Ah, yeah, but that's if they're down injured. You see, like, if you're down trying to waste time and extra time, it deserves to go on. And the clock up in the stadium will stop. There's an injury. It's stopped. They're only fooling themselves here, lads. And the referee will often tell you, lads, the watch has stopped here. Do you know what I mean? But mm. with, with kind of vague stuff like yellow cards where everyone in the ground isn't sure, has he that stopped now? Or yeah. is that part of the normal play? It's actually part of the normal play, but he uses his own discretion to add it on because he wants to draw it up. Yeah. Do you get me? This is where the problems yeah. are coming in. But like, you just can't have him for two minutes running around looking for Merchant and then McManus just to give him yellow cards and then two minutes of the six not being played. That's madness. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe there's a bit of discretion to go on there, but not three, three minutes, mm. 20 seconds discretion. Yeah. Yeah. And the begging point is a very good one. Yes, he took time over it but when does a, a, an elaborate free take routine turn into time wasting and at what point do you start stopping do you give him 30 seconds to do his free take and after that then you're stopping the watch or the pun- like Pat says the punishment for wasting time over free is to throw the ball up it's not to stop the clock it's part of it's part of the play mm. you don't add that on in the end 
Do you know? So like, I mean, like, I don't know. It it, it, seem, it seems to me there's an easy fix from all of this. And if the clock is up in the, in the, the stadium and the referee is giving out yellow cards and the clock stays ticking, we know what's going on. Mm. And the ref can't pull the wool over anyone's eyes to draw it mm. up at the end because it's transparent. At the moment now, he's in all the control and the, everyone in the stadium is at his mercy, yeah. has an, having a notion when this is... <laughs> or, or the players. Or the players don't have a notion. Do you know what I mean? So, like, it's definitely a weird one. Another one, lads, geez, we seem to be getting dominated by referee talk here, <laughs> lads, but we'll, we'll finish it up on this one. It was the black card. I tied myself in knots trying to figure out what was going on with this. I thought, the, I thought Galway were, were completely breaking the rules of Gaelic football when, when the goalkeeper, Gleeson, got the, got the black card. And it was a deserved black card. So, I thought they subbed off Gleeson while in the sin bin. Mm. and then nominated Ali to go off right I thought that's what they did and I was like surely that's some form of cheating because Ali comes back on then after 10 minutes and I was like no but the goalie was in the sin bin how is Ali how, they can't just replace the goalkeeper and then nominate Ali to go off in the <laughs> sin bin anyway I had it arseways <laughs> so they used up two subs um, to actually account for this black card so they took they brought on Ronan Obuelon the sub goalkeeper for Ali that was one transaction, as if you'll call it. So Gleeson is still in the sin bin. They just subbed off Oli for the sub goalkeeper. Then when Gleeson was ready to get out of the sin bin, they subbed on Oli for Gleeson. So they never subbed off the... I don't, lads, I just, I just confused myself completely. <laughs> but it was smart thinking. I know it was a waste of two subs, Colin, which you might not be prepared to do. But listen, last week, I would presume that, you know, Galway have a lot of homework done on, their, on, on the black card. Like last week, they went into a situation where they couldn't get Killian McDade back in the field. This week, they come out with some total new yeah. that has worked in their favour. So, you know, it's, it's, it's clever thinking, clever management. But the point I want to make is, what was the difference in... The two goal, goal with goalkeepers tackles, both led with the feet. One's a black card, one's a yellow card. Yeah, well, one with the first one was a trip. The second one, the second one could have been a straight red. That was like a soccer yeah, challenge. Like so it was a, despi- it, right? it was a despicable yeah. challenge. But, that you know. But I was thinking myself, either a straight red, or black. Yeah, he's led with his feet, so it's either you know out, absolutely outrageous, or it's deemed a trip. What 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 is it like? Yeah, you, you know, for me, the, like. I think the first one was more of an obvious trip. The second one was coming out really recklessly and maybe mm. was more reckless and dangerous than yeah. than cynical. Do you know? Or, well, I don't think the first one was cynical. I think it was just he mistimed it and tripped him, so there was not much he could yeah, do. Yeah. But he he kind of led with the feet a little I bit did, too, didn't was, he? Gleason? Was, both was, did, but like b- both were leading with the feet. And look, that's I, very I dangerous know. for Gaelic yeah. footballers. G- g- soccer goalkeepers do that because you can only, you know what I mean. You, well, you can use your hands as well in soccer, but they seem to save with their feet a lot more. I don't know. Gaelic football goalkeepers generally don't come out leading with the feet. Yeah, mm. and, and that one as well, I suppose it was a clear goal chance and Brennan was about to pull the trigger. The other one, there was a chase on for the ball. That was it, and yeah. I think the keeper had committed too far and thought, right, I just need to make sure nothing stupid happens here. And he, yeah, it was very dangerous, what he did. Yeah, so like, I mean, w- would you consider putting on... I'm, I'm very disrespectful towards goalkeepers, if I'm being honest. I think anyone outfield could be a good goalkeeper. <laughs> I think they could. Um, because, like, I mean, you're catching, you're kicking, especially a midfielder. And a lot of the kickouts now are taps. Or, you mm-hmm. know, okay, there is a skill to do more aggressive ones like Began and Cluxton and these lads, but if there's a short one on, tap it to him, or else put it on a tee. Mm-hmm. I wasn't able to kick off the ground, but you put it on a tee, I'll get a good boot at it, all right. So listen, my call on this is that any decent outfielder can play in goals for 10 minutes. Well, y- you Why see- waste your two subs? Because let's be honest, the likes of Dublin, and the subs are down to five now, so you have two gone. Mm-hmm. So the likes of Dublin, I think, might put, because they have such an impact off their bench, I think the likes of Dublin could put one of their, I don't know, James McCarthy seems to me like he could do anything. <laughs> yeah, <but> I, <laughs> Put him in goals. It'd be a brave decision to put James McCarthy in the goals. It's only for 10. It's only for 10. <laughs> but I, I kind of agree with you. Like when you, when you look at Cavan, I, 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 like Raymond Galligan was a corner forward, right? Yeah. Converted to a goalkeeper now and, and damn good one. But go back to your mate, Graham Brody. Like, she like I I've watched videos when you're analysing opposition stuff like that where you see him, you know, and deep into the opposition's half. So, it does make sense. Like, I wouldn't say it's it's an easy position to play in. Le- they have all star goalkeeper from Leash Fergal Byron play cornerback on the under twenty one team that won a Leinster. Like, it's not a, like a, it's, to me. I yeah. think any. Uh, 
Brody played outfield for Port Leash. Our Leash goalkeeper now that's keeping Brody out of the the mm. uh, nets plays wing forward for his club. Niall Morgan plays wing forward for his club with Tyrone. Like the talent, uh, Began plays outfield. The, the These are converted outfielders rather yeah, than actual you know. traditional. I can't play outfield. I'm playing mm. goals. I had he, I had he going goals <coughs> last year myself for a half and thought it was the most terrifying experience of my clean life sheet. Like, clean sheet but like nothing to do with me really <laughs> just but like I do have a much bigger appreciation from keepers you say you disrespect them but nothing to do with the cliche you put your worst player in the goals <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that well traditionally when you're underage you'd always have your worst player in the goals yeah. Yeah. and like I, I, geez, I don't want to be disrespectful to the Deep ladies Conan. game in the camogie <laughs> but they still seem to be in the situation where they have a goalkeeper that's not necessarily you know that comfortable you know what I mean on the ball or anything they seem to they haven't progressed to actually having a a player that's like I don't know a goalkeeper that's not a failed outfield player yeah well like Cluxton's like you know, Dublin's most important player sort of like you know, yeah and he plays obviously outfield for his club sometimes yeah. too so I look at the goalkeeping's changed definitely mm. and like I, I do think it's 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 definitely somewhere that an outfield player could, could move into quickly lads division 3 and 4 is Cork beat down easily um, they're too good for division 3 we know that they had 11 different scores they were 14-5 up we'll, we'll concentrate on the division 1 2 division 1 games in part 2 14-5 up and then they lost uh, their centre forward White to a second yellow and down made a little bit of a rally so like I mean they're in prime position now to get out of that Ronan McCarthy said after the game a good professional performance by us controlled performance particularly in the first half we're down just put 15 men behind the ball and inside the 65 we're good and controlled and patient we waited for openings and we're well worth our 8-2 half time advantage they didn't score for 30 minutes of the first half so it's interesting he went on to say then that Brian Hurley is back in the next two weeks Mark Collins and James Lockery are all back in the mix Cork looking good shape lads there's no doubt about that but it's interesting like you see Tyrone against Kerry and they played very defensively against the wind and it worked for them do you know like I mean I do think a very defensive tactics against the gale force wind is the only way to go really like you frustrate them but Cork obviously with Keane O'Neill's influence who Ronan McCarthy mentioned also after the game were able to pick them apart and score 8, eight points to 2 against a very defensive team Cork's a very strong team like arguably they, they are too strong how they found themselves in Division 3 is a mystery but um, you know would you be surprised if if <sighs> You know, if Cork were to find themselves going all the way straight up into Division One, with a couple of promotions, could easily, yeah, it could, yeah. It could, could easily happen. So, um, you know, there's some, and when you think of like the likes of Hurley and, and Mark Collins coming back, but I, I'd say they were the highest scoring team the weekend, 16, 17 scores by country mile, where yeah. everyone else was was low scoring. They got they got six they got sixteen points, but it, it, like I mean, a lot of the criticism of Cork in the last four or five years is that tactically they're not you know, the smartest. And maybe against a defensive team like that, they might have struggled. They tried defensive systems themselves. And Keane O'Neill, to be fair to him, has been around the block enough that maybe has give it, maybe give them that little bit of tactical noose that they didn't have, Conan. Yeah, and I think, well, when they're putting up those scores and beating down who would be their biggest rivals for Division 3, beating yeah. them like, that well without Collins and Hurley, that shows that they really have their act together. Like, and you just compare it to Derry at the other side of the table who are just like Jekyll and Hyde when they've got Shane McGuigan or they don't have Shane McGuigan. Do you know what I mean? Like they're relying on a player to come in and change everything for yeah. them. Cork we'll, aren't. we'll talk about Shane McGuigan in performance of the weekend because he's one uh, bright spark for you. Limerick in Division 4, they've made a perfect start as well. They robbed Carlo. They were three points down going into injury time and they scored 1-1 to get out of Dr. Cullum with uh, an unexpected win. Um, Carlo going to be absolutely kicking themselves in this one. So the... They got it back. The three points down. They got a goal, and then they got a penalty. So Ian Corbett tapped the ball over the bar from the penalty spot, which is completely um, understandable. I'd say, like, I mean, no matter how much he really wanted to rattle that <laughs> net, <laughs> it was not the right thing. So to is that do. allowed then? Yeah, is that like a fisted hand? That's pass? allowed to do that yeah. in that situation where you're doing the maths. But, yeah. <laughs> but it, like, especially against a team against like Carlo, obviously, who's who would be defensively minded to score one one going into injury time would be. And, and obviously two very valid goal chances so you'd like to think that you know maybe Carlo could have closed it out whatever but it leaves them in the they're in trouble now they've lost a- two absolutely now they, they, are all, they are all beating each other two isn't going to kill you a bit like Kildare and Armagh Kildare aren't completely gone because Roscommon have lost two Armagh yeah. have lost one you, you can't lose three obviously but five wins could get you out of fo- out of division four but Carlo are obviously it's squeaky bum time for them now because uh, they can't well, well they can't lose to win every you other know, game they have to yeah. win every other game which, which, which they could possibly do but it's a big ask it looks 
it looks very much now as like Limerick are in, in, in pole position to, to, to come back up and Wexford had a good win and down in down yeah, in Waterford, Waterford. albeit a you battling know, win. Very low scoring, but um good result for It's actually for a good Wexford division four because the last couple of years the likes of Leash were in it and Carlo came out convincingly and this year it's impossible to really say who's coming out of division four and I'd say division three second place is probably completely up for grabs as well. No, nobody seems to want to come out second <laughs> by the looks of things. Last one before we get it <coughs> going into part two, lads, is to take the wind or not to take the wind. So obviously all these games are kind of ruined. That's why we're not going to analyse them too much because like, let's be honest, the wind ruins games. Tyrone, Kerry just was a complete battle, which Tyrone mm-hmm. won. Um, Galway, Donegal, the wind ruined it because it wasn't really favouring either team. It was a weird wind. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of wides in that. But most games had a wind completely down the field. Um, and I suppose when you win the toss, Kildare won the toss and chose to go against it. Um, I think Tyrone won the, and it, Kildare obviously lost after winning the toss. Tyrone lost the toss or won the toss and chose to go against it and they won. So it's always down through the years. Do you take the wind? Do you not take the wind? Always with Port Leash because we were favourites. We took the wind and we went six, seven points up and the other team was demoralised. And the whole idea was do not give these lads any belief. Don't let them think they can beat us and come into half time with something to build on. So what was that? And I remember with Leash as well, we always used to take the wind. Maybe for the other reason, you might be underdogs. You get a great start here, lads. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. let's not be out of the game or whatever. Depends where I could all, I'd always convince either an underdog or are a favourite to take the win <laughs> for different reasons. But I did so, I just did some looking in this from reading, reading the match reports. So Mayo took the wind and won, luckily enough in the end. Armagh took the one, one took the wind. Armagh had the wind in the first half and won convincingly. Cork had the wind in the first half, won convincingly. Mead had the wind in the first half, ran up a big lead and won it out. Roscommon had the wind uh, in the first half, went in at half time, well in the lead and won it. Limerick took the wind, went the, uh, had a lead of uh, four points, lost it, and then won. Luckily, in the end, maybe they're not they're not a great example. Antrim had the wind against London, ran up a big lead and held out. The Tyrone went against the wind against Kerry, and went four down and came back. Derry went against the wind against Tip and went in one up against the wind and still won it. So we have seven of taking the wind. And we have two wins against the wind. The other match reports, I just couldn't find out which way the wind <laughs> was not part of it. Do you get my point? I, I think the, the maths here, lads, I, in I, my little experiment, is to always <laughs> take the win. I don't think, I, I don't think it's, look, it, it's something I would kind of always leave, leave up to players. Um, you know, as a decision, lads, which way do you want to go? And it's something we could in, we, we could in, uh, Engage the group in, in making the decision, but like for me, when you look at into county football, like we'll be discussing Mead and Mayo later on. I, I was actually at the match, and um, like I think county teams now are well equipped to play against the wind, they, they retain the ball, and the way the game is played now, it's probably suits teams to, to run the ball against the wind because there's not that much kicking in it. But I, I think. I know you have a good stat there, but I think it's around. <laughs> I think it's around. Oh. Well, would you, when you, sorry, how far ahead as a manager would you look at the forecast? Like on the meeting on Thursday night, would you say, Les, there's going to be a, a gale, but then you don't, I suppose you don't know what direction it's blowing we're, in, do we're, you? So we're speaking about coming out, out of Division 4. I remember, like when we were relegated, initially out of Division 3 and went down to Division 4 with Loud, we had a lot of young guys coming back in, and like we had a sticky enough first first assignment it was away to Watford down in in, um, in Watford's college Farmer grounds Field, and, and yeah no it was in, in Watford IT and it was right. a lovely surface and hole up but jeez there was a gale of wind straight down the middle of the field and we played with it and we got into it decent enough we were five six points up and you think it's grand but then awfully, you know, Watford scored a couple of shit goals and under pressure and, and we got back and Ryan Bones kicked two great frees into into a strong breeze to get us out the gate and, and ultimately we got promoted from that result but I think it's irrelevant and I really do I think like I was at the game in Navin and said yesterday and we'll we, we'll analyse it like and, and um, like if you're playing against Tyrone and who is defensively excellent like you know they're set up really to, to play against the wind and defend against you yeah. So like Tyrone is probably is probably more suited than anyone to play against the wind and defend against the lead. So I, I could never imagine them saying, Do you know what, we'll go out here, we'll we'll be expressive, we'll go with a team here, we'll kick on, we'll try and get seven, eight, nine points ahead 
and we'll sit back and, and, and defend it. I, I'd say yeah. they want to they want to get a team like Kerry. They're going to grind them into a submission, make it a battle, and, and take from there. So so it suits some teams. It, it doesn't suit Maybe others. Maybe you're right. Yeah. Maybe it def- it suits the defensive team to go against it. Yeah. Defend hard while you've all your energy, and then in the second half, do you know what I mean? Have yeah. the elements. Mm. I can kind of see that. Mm. I and, never, and then I the never played s- for a defensive team, so I don't know what their <laughs> mentality. <laughs> Colin, Colin, <laughs> Colin, what do you think? <laughs> he, was in, he was in goals. <laughs> no, but, but I actually, I, I always think you should go with it, and I thought there were three reasons for that. And the first one is because the wind could die or it could change, so you take it while you have it. The second one is like you sort of know what you have to do in the second half. If you run up six point lead, as you say, you strap yourself in, get down to work, keep them out by six points. Yeah. And if you get a goal in the second, you know, it really kills the other team then. And the third one is just like. The, the game opens up in the second half and you're going to need that when you're going against the wind you need tired legs so you can get past them easier whereas if you're coming out like against a fresh team it's easier it's harder to get through them yeah no I completely listen that, that's it so after all the discussion we'll just basically say that you go against the wind you take the my, my father always said just take, take the take advantage the why not <laughs> take the advantage right we'll be back and we'll take a look at some of the Division 1 games So Dublin 115, Monaghan 115, um, lads, this was the most uh, unusual comeback I've ever come across. Like, I mean, it's incredible. Conor Boyle scored a point on 67 minutes, the full back from Monaghan, to make it 115 to 11 points. Seven points after 67 minutes. And like Dublin, after being terrible all night, as bad as I've ever seen Dublin, terrible all night, managed to draw that game and score 1-4 to no score for the rest of the game. How did they do it? I don't know. I think Mon- I think they get a run on teams and it's very hard and the whole aura of Dublin and, you know, they, they pin them in on their kickouts and suddenly Monaghan are panicking. But Desi Farrell said after the game, it seemed like we lacked the intensity that was required. Slow out of the traps. They were going at it hard and we struggled to compete. They overran us and they were up for it and wanted it more. You don't get much better analysis than that. That mm. sums it up perfectly. Monaghan dropped a lot of lads behind the ball got loads of turnovers we know defensive teams when they get turnovers look really exciting and they're top of the ground and they're breaking out at pace and they're putting in nice hand passing moves and they're running off the shoulder and they'll kick the odd ball and Tomas O'Shea was saying what great football they played and yeah Dublin were giving them the turnovers in the summer Dublin would ne- wouldn't give them any of those turnovers so I don't know whether to laud Monaghan for those tactics when they've been proven not to work against Dublin they worked the other night so I don't know I don't know what really to think about it yeah it's it's difficult it was it, it was a good watch I thought li- like I think I think Banty has to get a good bit of credit and how Monaghan, Monaghan have went against uh, about the business but Monaghan have they have decent players um you know, I think um, McManus is excellent. Conor McCarthy is excellent. They have scoring forwards that can hurt you. But the pace... Dropping, yeah, the they were pace. dropping most of the forwards back, though. Other than McManus, they were bringing them back. That's what disappointed me, because I think the analysis now is that you have to beat Dublin by by troubling them. You know what I mean? I talk here... I was really disappointed that Kieran Hughes now didn't sp- stay in the full forward line. You know, leaving one forward up and defending with everybody else, that's been proven not to work. Dublin laugh at that. Right now, they didn't laugh at it the other night because they didn't experience forwards that just kept coughing up the ball. They won't, that won't work in the summer for Monaghan. It won't, though. Well, like, like what's working? Like, like what's working? Winning All Ireland, winning also title. Like, like for me, the other night, the, the the standout was how poor Dublin were. You know, like they've they've set the bar so high and the standard is so high. But then when you look through the Dublin team, like. Darren Mullen, Dan O'Brien, um, Aaron Bourne coming in. Um, Bugler, Bugler was excellent when he came in. Like Pater Andrews. Um, where, where's the other guys? Where, like Mannion not starting, Connolly not starting. Um, well, Con wasn't there, and obviously Johnny Callan wasn't there. Um, like, but but for me, I think I think Monaghan have a different angle to them this year. I don't think they're as defensive as they've been in the past, um, and I think they're. They're a bit more expressive going forward. Niall Cairns is excellent. Um, McCarthy's excellent. Kieran Hughes is excellent. They've some very, very good footballers. And I could see them 
you know, after the the weekend that's in it, they're in there in the mix with the best teams in Ulster. Yeah, no, I, d- I definitely think so. I think where Dublin's problem was was obviously up front because they they had Howard in midfield, so they've lost him out of the forwards, and they lost Mannion wasn't in the forwards, and Con wasn't mm. in the forwards. So you really only had Kilkenny and you had Dean Rock, who were regulars in the forwards. You had Dan O'Brien, Darren Mullen, and then Aaron Byrne, who was completely ineffective against the defensive team. He didn't know whether he was coming or going. He was indecisive. I thought Dan O'Brien was indecisive. <coughs> Mullen wasn't really in it. But for me, Dublin don't give do- the amount the amount of turnovers. Dublin were just lazy. And then when Monaghan broke, they, ju- they weren't tracking. It didn't look yeah. like they, were, they, they cared that much, Dublin. They were very ineffective up front. Like they, they only scored two points in the first half, but they, they were just like slow on the ball. Letting boys come in and hammer them. When yeah. Monaghan have 13, 14 players back sometimes, it was... You don't see that, and they were taking shots in. They're like the young boys are panicking, taking shots at panic. You don't see Dublin taking the young boys shots. didn't look like they were coached the way Dublin usually break that stuff down. Yeah, I think you so. Know? And then they were also I thought I thought they were very naive in the way they were pushing up on the kickouts and like every time Bacon was just going over the top, and it was either one of the Hughes, usually Cairn sometimes that were making a break beyond all Dublin's numbers and. Bacon was just floating it out in front of them, and that's a regular tactic of Monaghan. Yeah. That's not that's not new from Monaghan. So I don't know. I think I think the Dublin lads had in their heads will push up man on man, but they didn't have any sort of zonal sense that they were trying to stop that, and nobody seemed to fix it either. And it meant that every time Monaghan either turned the ball over and their attack was quick, or Bacon got the ball out to midfield, caught it, the attack was quick, so their attacks were lasting. 15, 20 seconds, whereas Dublin were throwing around and getting hammered into it. That's the thing. And we know Jim Gavin had it tied down with their 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 press. He has four across the middle. We didn't really seem to see any structure under press. Like Conan said, Began was getting long kickouts away into lads with lads into space or even, you know, just kick passes in general that seemed to be freeing lads up. Look, has Desi tried to you know, has Desi Farrell trying try, tried to put his slant on it differently, and they're trying something different in terms of of a setup or how to go about things, and maybe it's just taking guys, you know, time to to buy into it. But yeah. the question is now is, to, is 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 you know the support act coming into this Dublin team? It, it, obviously, you know when you lose players like the players we're talking about, but you know is that conveyor belt of Dublin players there that's not there? To, like for me. Saturday night was probably as poor performance as they've given in a long, long time. A long, long time. Yeah, there's and no doubt. There's no doubt about that. In the first half, they looked like they looked like a Division Two team. They didn't look like a. Yeah, well, look, maybe that's allowed or whatever. But that intensity, that that aggressive, and and take the goal that got them back into it. Like Kevin McManaman lumped the ball up into the air into Hill 16 end yeah. and and got on the end of it himself. So they got a tinge of luck about the goal. And I know, I know they've they've been brilliant in the in the past of breaking down teams, but. You know, it was actually a bit of luck that got him back into the game, really. Luck. And it was poor defending by Darren Hughes because he went up when it bounced. to his panic mm. when it bounced, and you see that in soccer. When the minute bounced, don't let it bounce is always the way. And Hughes really should have fisted it. But look, it, with the wind, they didn't mention the wind in commentary at all. There was a clear wind for me with the rain. You could see the rain sheeting yeah. down into Hill 16. And yeah, Marty was saying the sideline flags weren't blowing. But sure, Croke Park is just so, so bizarre. I've often seen one side on the field the flag's going one way and the other side of the field the flag's going the other way like it was obvious there was a wind going down into Hill 16 I, I, I'm I, not so sure because like the greatest free kick i ever seen in my life well, I've seen the other night right <laughs> and like Rory Began knocks a knocks a ball over the bar from 65 now brilliant kick but there's no way Willie done that into the well, that's true that's true do, do you know what I mean so like it seemed uh, to be the wind high up sheeting down towards there you could see it but I, I agree Rory Bregan's a freak that's just I've never seen anything like that before no ever. neither have I it's, ever it's, it's not natural like it, an, there was 10 years ago hurlers were my a 65 wasn't a gimme in hurling yeah do you know what I mean and the, the ball's lighter now and they're just tapping them over but like a 65 was never a gimme is this a 65 like it's a bu- it's a bugbear of mine when you see goalkeepers having to come up to kick they kick 45s and, and 50 yard frees like you know go back 15 20 years ago every you know every county had maybe two or three forwards that could kick kick 45s and, and take frees and I understand now with the with more an emphasis on kicking from your hands fellas probably just can't kick off the ground like they used to but I've absolutely no qualms with Rory Beckham being yeah. your number one goalkeeper or your free taker it was astonishing what he did in the weekend no it was definitely was so like I mean I don't want to be too negative on Monaghan they were obviously like they looked like they were flying it they looked like they were up for it and they ran Dublin completely into the ground like we, we said last Thursday 
the the their half back line is very very um, attacking. Um, you had Michael Bannigan scoring two points. You had Desi Ward scoring one. He was ah, look to be honest with you, they were all really defending outside of uh, outside of Conor McManus, and they were defending the the scoring zone where Dublin yeah. like to tap over the percentage point. Dublin don't like to go outside that, and they were aggressive in it. And it was a wet night, and they got loads of turnovers, and because they were up for it. I don't want to put the performance just down to the rock for a Dublin and Dublin weren't like I mean but to me the Monaghan the other night seemed very like Monaghan under Malachy O'Rourke if I'm being honest I thought they might have progressed a little bit from from, from there um, but it didn't it just I think Malachy O'Rourke's Monaghan would have which they have done in the last two years probably would have been up for it more than Dublin and beaten Dublin the other night I, I kind of disagree with you a little bit I think I, I think um I think Monaghan are more expressive now going forward. Um, I, I think I think they use the ball better now. I know I know there's a case for Kieran Hughes um, staying further up the forward line, but the transition play was exceptional the other night. The, yeah, the, the willingness to get forward. But when was you brilliant. But you remember Tyrone, we mm. and Dun- Donegal. When a defensive team gets turnovers and the other team is caught out of position. Sure, they all look dynamic and excellent breaking, and you think, Jesus, that's a lovely style of football they're playing. But it's because they're co- the other team's coughing up possession, and now they have the run on them. And Dublin are backtracking while Monaghan are going. You know what I mean? And they're mm. they're throwing a few runs around. I do think that if you take those turnovers away from Monaghan, I'm not sure you'd see that same yeah. type of dynamic. Well, I think yeah, uh, you're right. If they play Dublin in the summer, they don't get those turnovers, but. Dublin are also set up better. Like we know, they, they don't get caught out with those counter attacks. They're set up better. I don't think Merchant had a good game sweeping. I don't think he really knew where to be. A couple of balls into McManus, and he seemed to be at the other side of the pitch. Now I'm sure McManus is switching his run. But well, you'd be doing well to sweep the Mac and Espy pass to McManus, which was that sensational. Was, the depth for that pass was yeah. unbelievable. Like I actually think that Simons was doing well. They stay with him, and there's just nothing you could do about it. Yeah. But in saying that, Monaghan would be thinking. They, I think they left one five out there as well. Like oh, easy scores mm-hmm. in they the did. first half, so they could have gone in with two fourteen in one half. And you know, I don't know if they would have done that say last year. They had a fifty three percent conversion rate in the first half. Um, Dublin had a twenty three percent conversion Jesus. rate. Now Dublin only scored three points, and then Dublin scored one twelve from fifteen shots in the second half. It's an amazing how Dublin can just get in, regroup. You really need a good lead on them, like because when they <laughs> when they start coming back at you, like this is Monaghan after holding them out for sixty seven minutes. Mm-hmm. I'm taking it easy. I was right, like writing down notes as in this is the worst hammering Dublin have taken in a long, long time. <laughs> like yeah. honestly, how did they draw on the match? And it's like, do you rip all this up or like? I mean, what is like? Dublin will probably be delighted. They will be delighted in the way they were able to pull that out of the fire. But then again, it's nothing new. We know what they're like. They're very, very hard. And now the aura of Shit, we're about to beat this, beat Dublin. Yeah, look, it's not new to Monaghan either. Monaghan have beaten them this last couple of National League matches, so it wouldn't be yeah. new to them. Um, I was just impressed with Monaghan. I was impressed in, in how they used the ball going forward. Um, some of the points they kicked in in, in difficult conditions. Um, I suppose, look, you're nitpicking at Dublin, and and you're saying would that use to such a high standard when you see a really inferior performance from them? You're saying to yourself, wow, but. Um, I suppose, look, you have to credit them, they got it back into it, but uh, for me, the, the the thing that was, you know, that that aggression that was missing from Dublin, I know you guys like James McCarthy who brings it to the to, to the table, you know, all the time and exceptional, yeah. but for me, the, the, the players that come in to replace the players that's gone out, they, you know, for me, I, I, I thought they could be a little bit more in terms of aggressiveness and show a little bit more eagerness to, to say, put a hand up and say, here, listen, I want to be part of this Dublin team going forward. Yeah, no, definitely. Conor McMahon has scored an unbelievable point in the first half. We know that. Uh, James McCarthy scored. I don't know whether to criticise James McCarthy for having no left yeah. <laughs> and having to, having to almost contort his body yeah. to go off the outside yeah. of the right. But that that was a very difficult technique. He did, he did yeah. and pulled off. But mate, practice your left. No, it was, it was very nice, but like I would definitely be telling him to go on his left. There. That, that's something you see at, at lower club level, which fa- where sometimes it's embarrassing to have to do that because you've, no, yeah. you've no second foot, isn't it? And it, like because he it was such a good skill of that he pulled it off and executed it 
covered the fact that, mate, you're senior in the county, you need to clip off the inside of your left. Why don't you land to train in two hours before with Cluxton <laughs> and practice your left? Yeah, well, I'm not going to question James McCarthy. No, <laughs> no, whether well, he can kick with his right or his left. I, I question, you know? I question everyone. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he can play in no but goals. It, James McCarthy is a freak of a brilliant player. He like, I mean, he's a leader. He's a warrior. Every game is as important to him as every other one. This is a very, very small criticism of him. Yeah, he's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, he is. He's that fantastic. That he chose to score with one foot over the other. Like, that's the criticism. Well, should, really, we cri- yeah. should we compliment him for the unbelievable technique of doing that or criticise him for saying, Jesus, how do you not have a left foot? What age is he? 30? So he's around since 11. Yeah, I, t- I, t- I think it was just a brilliant, brilliant score. And um, I, I think, you know, like... Just compliment him for what he's done. Well, you know what I mean? Well, it's, well, no, a, it's, look, a, you, it's a difficult skill. You can compliment him. I'll I'll kind of criticise him, but then compliment him loads in case he's mm-hmm. listening to it. Um, Donegal obviously lost to Galway. This was an incredible comeback from from Galway. They went seven points down after Kieran Thompson's goal. And Jesus, you're watching this. I of course I knew the result, so I was like, okay, they come back. It ruins the game on you. Because when you're watching that, you're like, Jesus, there's no way back for Galway. And then you get more excited about the comeback. They scored 2-2 without reply. Um, so it was an unbelievable comeback. Porrick Joyce said after the game, it has been questioned in Galway before, having heart and character and and had we the bottle for these big matches. Come to Donegal and get two easy points is no easy feat. So hats off. I'm, pr- I'm so proud of the lads and I'm so proud to be their manager. That's a nice little one at the end, isn't it? I'm so proud to be their manager. Players would read that and just give them a nice, warm, fuzzy mm-hmm. feeling inside. Jesus, he, yeah. he loves us. Um, but that was it. That was the thing. Like, I mean, Galway looked dead and buried and were able to come back and scored some great points, um, Colin, mm-hmm. and scored two absolutely in- superb goals. Two cornerbacks. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think that's Johnny Heaney's second goal, isn't it? Yeah. National League, one with his left foot, one with his right foot. Um, yeah, he did that. He scored in Castle Bar against Mayo, an unbelievable yeah. goal too. It's not unusual for him. And the, the other goal was... Sean s- Kelly, yeah. Yeah, solid with his right, finish with his left. But for me, you know, so far the most outstanding player in the country by a country mile is Shane Walsh. He is just incredible to yeah. look at. His, his ball carrying ability off both feet, his shooting off both feet... Um, ah, he's unreal we're going to talk about him in performance at the weekend because he was absolutely yeah, brilliant but um, Galway for me they're all the time looking to play the ball forward you know they're not retaining the ball in the slope I, if anything when they get into a situation where they were pointed to up I thought they start to probably retain the ball going backwards and sideways a little bit um, you know similar to what happened in Kerry and, and Joyce was given out about that he wants the team going forward all the time but it's very evident in, in the play they're all the time oddies. looking the push I forward and there's some great players like Daly's a very good player Finity's excellent yeah. Walsh is, is exceptional Comer's exceptional like they've great offensive players and they're a huge team too Daly's a huge big, man yeah. Finity's, na- Finity's mm-hmm. a very big man we know Comer's huge he yeah. picks a huge midfield like they're a big strong physical team and it is obvious it is obvious the coaching and it's obvious how easy it is to change the mindset of a team Baz, I want that played forward and play it by the foot if you can, but let's move forward. Yeah. I thought he'd aggressive uh, so changes at half time. He moved Comer to midfield and moved Shane Walsh out into the 40, and that changed the game. Shane Walsh yeah. ran the show, running into the wind. He would have been wasted in a full yeah. forward in the second half, I get kind of against that. It was kind of blown into a corner, but it, it was more favouring Galway in the first half, Donegal in the and second. And the brave Galway in how they play. Like they, 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 tracked, they, they tracked the man, but I don't think it's a case of they just empty out. They, they they interchange all the time but who drops and who pushes but again their offensive play is excellent they, they get into the right areas of the pitch and you can see the coaching and, and you know John like he's a good management team around him too Power Joyce like John Dibley's in with him and he's proved himself to be a very very good coach yeah. so you can see you can see what's happening and for me you know for me so far I, I think they've been a breath of fresh air to the to the National League and, and arguably the best team in it at the minute now I'm not saying that you know that they beat Dublin or to round that further down the line but um, to watch them playing they've been exceptional yeah, since no, they're great. Over. and in fairness the pitch in Letterkenny was in, gr- in great shape I suppose mm. maybe coming after seeing the match in Eden Dork you're like jeez this looks like a lovely <laughs> carpet here altogether because that was yeah. such a, a battle and not nothing wrong about Eden Dork it was just pull, pulled into their ground um, at the last minute but that's it two cornerbacks um, we call this Conan <laughs> this did. is it this is it Atta- play outfield players now I would have a question mark of poor Johnny Heaney having to mark for Jamie Brennan <laughs> yeah <coughs> do you know but like I mean at the same time it was the two cornerbacks and Sean Kelly marked Michael Murphy and did very well on him 
but this is it. Like, and if you if you watch the first goal, Johnny Heaney, Shane Walsh again, like Galway are moving up through the pitch, and Johnny Heaney is on mark because he's marking Jamie Brennan, who's now helping out in defence wherever way he can, and Heaney is just ghosting along and, and watches everybody get sort of panicked by Shane Walsh's run, and then suddenly he's free, and it's a great finish shoulder. from him. The second one, like he picks it up on the forty-five. For, second one's terrible defending. It's terrible defending. And it's so Connor O'Donnell is the problem there. Like that, you can't allow him past you like that. I think there's two problems there. So I think Sean Kelly only goes because Michael Langan, who's behind uh, O'Donnell, ends up following. Who is it? I think it's the goalie number five. Who was that? Are you sure that wasn't Niall O'Donnell? Niall O'Donnell was the covering player. No, it was Langan. He follows Gary O'Donnell out of the way on this sort of loopy, non-threatening run, and he right. ends up getting dragged away. So there's complete space behind O'Donnell, who should stop him anyway. But that—that's your midfielder and your centre back. That should be yeah. nothing coming through there. There was no goal on when he got the ball. There no, should have been no but, goal. But there. many corner backs would even take that on. Would like when when Connor Connor O'Donnell confronts him, like like I know it was bad defending. But but we can't be all the time as bad defending the bad defending. He, he he you know he breaks the tackle and he goes straight for goals. He steps you know he's soloing off his right. He steps off onto his left foot. Brilliant finish. Um, like but most cornerbacks when they'd receive that ball, they just recycle. Yeah, no, they, that's they, true. They, they, you know, so like for me, it's 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 what they've been encouraged to do. To, you, you know, have a go, take it on. You know, get get a, the offensive side of your man at all at all costs at all times. And it's just a breath of fresh air to look at. No, I completely agree. I think it was Gary O'Donnell running down the right wing in the first half and he ran and he ran past Porrick Joyce. Mm. And there mustn't have been anything going on ahead of him. I'd be surprised there wasn't because Finnerty and Walsh would make themselves available. And he stopped. Mm. And I was thinking this would be a good quick pass and he did it in front of Joyce. And I was like, that will not go down well. He turned and recycled. Mm. Right. And I was like, it just looked out of place when you know that's the way Galway, you know yeah. what I mean, want to play. That, that The attack has to count and it has to go in and it has to end. Mm-hmm. And then we'll defend the kick out. You know, but get a sh- get it in and get a shot off, lads. And they're encouraged mm-hmm. to do that. Um, there's uh, there's no doubt about that. What did you make of the Killian McDade injury, lads? Because he had to go off with it looked like a concussion. And I thought it was a dirty kind of challenge by Padder Padder Mogan. He was running with, at a lot of pace. Mogan hit him into the back. You know, he lost his footing then and went over on onto his head. And Donegal were smart enough while he was getting treatment to subbed off. Uh, they subbed off Mogan. Um, off the field because he could have been in danger of potentially a black card and a sin bin but they got a sub on and Killian McDade had to had to go off not sure if you have any any strong thoughts about that yeah no it's sort of like what we're saying <coughs> during the double Mayo game it's just you have to sort of you're told to go and nail people and maybe like there needs to be something clamped down from up above but like I know as a player and, and especially at county level they're, they're not going to go any yeah. Softer. But when the lad's running that fast to push him in the back, it's almost like you lose completely, con- complete control of your, you know what I mean, of yourself. And McDade hit the ground hard. Oh, maybe I'm reading too much into it. I thought it was smart that Donegal got him off the field very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, the two yellows, probably. Mark McHugh was given out on Twitter. So he said he spoke to Declan Bonner during the week. Um, Donegal trained in O'Donnell Park on Thursday night. But before that, the last time they were in O'Donnell Park was against Fermanagh last year. It's like having a w- an away game. Um, he said, my view is we kick both last minute frees in Bally Buffet. This is Mark McHugh talking about what he, Declan Bonner said um, first and then what he thought. Um, what's your th- <coughs> Obviously, Bally Bo must have been unplayable. Why else would they choose to do that? You, 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 you don't know why they choose to do it, but um, at this level, you'd still you'd still expect Michael Murphy. Like... Uh, Michael Murphy's was a gimme for him. That yeah, was a very I, I unusual. Think that, the I wind think was the, the the wind, the wind. He, Michael Murphy thought that wind would bring that back in. Yeah, because loads of points were tailing off left, yeah. weren't they? He yeah. didn't miss hit it. Like he, he actually kicked that the way he wanted. I think. Yeah, and the wind but, didn't take it in. But yeah. I think nine times out of ten, irrespective of where he's playing, he scores that. It's just a lack for me. For me, the the the, the one I'd have liked to see. I know um, Thompson kicked the forty five previous to that and it fell short and, and a couple of seconds later Michael Murphy kicks one and we know that Michael Murphy has, has the ability to kick those 45s but you know I I, I, I take um, Mark McHugh's point on board that you know in Bally Buffet and they're used to it but you still expect the player of, of Michael Murphy's ability to walk up it's a 35 yard 30 yard free you'd still expect him to knock it over the bar I can't understand why he didn't put it on the ground if it's yeah, that windy yeah. like someone with his ability to kick off the ground and look who are we to question Michael Murphy about how he should take frees but underfoot um, must have been bad because Sean O'Shea went off the hands in Eden Dark now the ground was very bad there but he's always off the ground yeah. I suppose it depends if, if, 
if it's he, anywhere slippy, you don't want to go off the ground because your standing foot might slip, isn't it? But O'Shea will o- O'Shea will kick close in ones from from the hands. I've seen him doing that in the past now, longer range ones. But just you know, and, and I would have you know taken freeze. I'd have liked him to see. For me, I would have preferred to kick that from the ground. Yeah, with that wind coming off. But on a bad day, would you be worried you might lo- you, your planted foot might slip? You know, in, in know, bad sure. conditions. A couple, not a, couple of min- a couple of minutes before that, he kicked the forty five. Yeah, uh, you know, from from a similar angle. Yeah, you so know, it's he weird just, that he didn't go off the ground. He just dropped though. it, dropped it, you know, outside the post, and it drifts back in. Which was now I know he has to kick the forty five off the ground. So, um, but uh, irrespective of what pitch he's in, you would expect. I'm sure ten, you know, nine times out of ten, Michael Murphy kicks that free. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it interesting that most of the Curra Finn lads are taking a break um, until after this Donegal game? But Steed has actually gone in to try and take his chance. He's taken off a half time in both. Um, in both games um, I'm fairly sure yeah Steed was gone Adrian Varley brought t- that was probably tactical to get Shane Walsh out to uh, centre yeah. forward and Varley's got a good bit of uh, he shows well for it right so there was probably a bit, an element of tactics um, in that one but Steed has come in earlier and I think that the the other Cora Finn lads are, are back in now but the other Cora Finn lads were right to take a, a full month off like instead of having this year running into another year do you know what I mean and things like that but yeah, that's it. Galway look in good shape, lads. I know that's not Donegal's full full team either. Donny, both those teams, for me, do, both those teams are knocking on the door of Kerry and Dublin. Yeah, it's, it, I was just going to say there, it looks as very much as if, you know, Galway will be, like, the, for me, they're the best team in, the, in, in, in Connacht, without a shadow of a doubt. Oh, yeah. They'll probably win it. You know, I'd, I'd fancy them heavily to win the Connacht Championship, but how relevant is that really now going forward? Yeah, yeah, um, true. Okay, listen, as we may leave it there because we're going way over time, we'll, we'll do performance of the weekend after this. Okay, so Shane Walsh, Colin, you were about to talk to him and I told you to stop because I wanted to rave about him in this section. That's his first point where he stuck it over the bar. He had about four Donegal lads running after him and they were so yeah. panicked about catching him. It was just a simple little sidestep back that sold about four of them. He is fantastic, and you're right, Conan, to mention Johnny Heaney timing his run off him. Mm. When you have a fella that drags three or four lads with him, yeah. isn't it just wait and stay on this lad's shoulder until he cuts back in? Like his pass for Comer's goal that he should have scored, he drove over the bar, was oh. absolutely sensational. His two points were sensational, one off the right, one off the left. Um, he's becoming a real leader for, for Galway. Now, I know he had one year with Kevin Walsh where he was playing really well he was man of the match in the Connacht final I think he should have got an all-star the year they've beaten in the semi-final but that was kind of living off scraps this is him being in the game all the time like he's constantly in the game he's constantly running at lads it's, it seems to be it, it seems to be you know applying now to, to, to get him on the ball yeah like you know you mentioned the, the score where he goes in this maze he run and he crosses the top of the D most fellas in that situation, when they come against that and they don't have a shadow off the left foot naturally, it's a you know it's a lateral pass or it's a one that's back out to the centre of the field. He steps inside and he drives at the guys again. He he's just what I love about him is you know when he, he his his range off both feet, he kicks freeze with, yeah. with both feet, sidelines with both feet. It's just he's just. An unbelievable skill. He's player. an unbelievable skillful player. He's really enjoying playing under Joyce. He's getting. The, have you? Did you see him getting a ball yesterday that wasn't either on the forty-five or inside it? Yeah. All the ball he's getting are in offensive positions where he's yeah. taking on his man. He's causing absolute mayhem and panic. He's doing this with one Bon Gallagher trying to mark him as well. Like one yeah. of Donegal's big guns. Just like Donegal might not have had their full team, but they had him on him and they couldn't cope with him. No. And, and Bon Gallagher got a run on him in the second half and Walsh chased yeah. him and Walsh caught up on him just like it wasn't even like hard. Yeah, but that, you see that pass you're talking about the Comer as well? You don't see that really like in, in football. Like just a delicate through ball landing perfectly into Comer's run. Like, yeah. Delicious. You don't really see that. No, Comer had to score yeah, that lad. Yeah, Comer did. did well in midfield too. He caught a couple of balls. You know, like I mean, they have options. Like uh, it was a great, it was a great move from from Joyce bringing Walsh out to eleven again because he would have been starved inside, mm-hmm. and you know he would have been getting frustrated. And that's that little bit of flexibility now that they're going to have to be able to move Walsh but from fourteen to eleven and back end. And Comer, I never really ex- expected them to have the option of moving Comer from eleven to nine. <laughs> you know what I mean? If yeah, they want but for me that'd be the obvious move for for Shane Walsh in in those circumstances when you're playing against Donegal, where you could be swamped with with, with you know, players getting in around you, but he makes so much happen. But for me, the difference under Parik Joyce now and, and under Kevin Walsh, he now looks as if 
he's not just worried about giving away possession all the time. Yeah. So now he's been expressive. He's probing the opposition. He's willing to take stuff on. Whereas under the last regime, he had some some good games. But for me, he was a cautious enough type of player for someone of a skill set. And he'd recycle the ball a lot, an awful lot more yeah. than, than, than doing the stuff he's doing at the minute. Yeah. Imagine having Shane Walsh and using him back in his own 45 lads. Isn't it terrible? It's like having a... Ferrari and going out to a field with it like I mean it doesn't make sense like it, it actually doesn't make sense you should be driving down the main street with that <laughs> <laughs> no but he is and you're right he wants he, like he's a total confidence player too because his mm. confidence for being so good would I think he's a little bit brittle and a game or two hand passing it off and that's not his game like his game is excitement mm, and yeah. going at lads and taking lads on all those things and he can score you know easily Kevin McLaughlin Came on at half time, scored 1-2. His goal was outstanding. Um, it was a great finish and it was all his work too because he, he uh, turned the ball over. He passed it to young O'Donoghue, was it? Ryan, who seemed to be getting congratulated by Aidan O'Shea and all after the match. But he just passed it to him, I thought. Um, he scored a brilliant free against the wind. He scored 1-2 in total. Like, I mean, yeah. completely changed it. But like uh, James Horn said after the game, we pinched two points. I'm delighted and we'll move on. I don't I, know whether I, he'd be delighted, would he? I, I, I was, I ah, know, listen, it was, it was poor, uh, you know, it was a poor performance that, that f- from Mayo. The one, the one bright spark for me was when Kevin McLaughlin came in, he was a different level. He kicked, he kicked a brilliant free um, into the hospital end in, in Navin, which was difficult. There was, there was guys standing up there before him, both first half and, and previous to that, had missed easier chances and he, he nailed a great free, scored a great point from play, but the finish... Um, you know, Robin Clark was turned over and he tried to get the ball back to the fullback, you know, even to kick it into the, you know, anywhere into the stand, game over, and, and it was intercepted. And, um, and that's the young lad I, I accused of making the two mistakes the week before, yeah, was it? Yeah, it was just, look, it was, it was, it was a difficult mistake to, to watch. And, and you know, I'd, I'd know Robin, I would have taken a few sessions with him at club level, and he's a really, really good fella. But, you know, even to dump the ball anyway, kick it out into uh, yeah. into the terrace, meet with winners, and to to you know to give the ball straight to a Mayo guy who slipped the ball into McLaughlin. But McLaughlin's poise for the finish was exceptional. Right, but, but um, that was, that was from a kick out as well, was it? That was that was that a uh, yeah. They, they kind of look with the wind. Me, Mead's Mead's problem in in, in goals is is outrageous. I, I I for one can't understand how they're not beating the door down for for Paddy O'Rourke now. I know he had his. His, his, his differences and he made comments that probably you know doesn't rest well um, but he's the difference in them winning that game yesterday and not winning the game um, they're just it's 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 just it's a hard watch now when you, we spoke earlier on about a goalkeeper like put someone in like and I know Marcus Brennan had stepped away and you know it's not been it's it's not been really critical of Marcus Brennan but the thing we spoke about last week well, they had a gale of wind and they were still going short madness Fucking like madness! Just get it down they there. Get it down there. Yeah. Like that's one thing you have to say about, about Galway. Even at times yesterday, they just lumped the ball out to the middle of the field. And, well, they and, and went long. Yeah. They're doing the right thing, and they're more often than not they're winning it anyway. Mm. So like, but I mean, it's the same. It's the same in, in the second in the first half. Mead probably dropped off a wee bit. Rob Henley was in goals, and he was kicking into a strong breeze, and and Mead hadn't pushed up, and Rob Henley got some great kicks. Out to especially to the to the right side of his defence and they won them comfortably, but then when Mead pushed up and he was forced to go along to to Aidan O'Shea, who I thought he had a poor game yesterday to be honest with you. When when they went long, you know Mead got in around them. Menton was very good. You know they they won a break. They you know Keoghan and James McEntee played a series of one twos and they score a goal. But they were forcing Mayo to actually kick the ball. Like previous to that, you know they weren't pushed up and Henley was was finding room with his kickouts, but. The mead, mead goalkeeping problem and look at they're not good enough offensively going forward they don't have well they're not good they're, n- they're not good enough c- de- offensively if they keep going short with their kick out and allowing the other team to start filtering back but I think there's a knock on effect th- th- of that they're, they're not getting the ball up in 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 at the offensive positions quickly they're probably look no they, they are they are missing quality they, forwards they, they, they are missing quality forwards like you know and and um, like I said to you yesterday, the difference in the two teams probably the result was Kevin McLaughlin was in. He scores one two against against a very very strong wind. Um, but like me, just don't have the forwards. I think one forward from play yesterday, one forward from play last week. But one score, yeah. Yeah, they're not getting they're not getting enough scores. 
No. Team, teams need to stop thinking that the opposition are perfect. Don't they? Like, you know, from kickouts, there's this assumption that if it, if it goes towards an opposition player, he's going to just gobble it up first time. Or yeah. when you're attacking, if it goes anywhere near a defender, he'll catch it. Like, they're susceptible to mistakes as well. Like, you know, well, I, I always think so. The opposition has a good fetching midfielder. We used to have him with Leash. And what it would turn out, it would turn out to almost be a disadvantage for you because the opposition would break all your kickouts. They, our lads would be going to catch it. The opposition would break it and they would have a plan around the breaks. Yeah. Whereas our plan is our midfielder catch it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so if, it he, actually, catch it, if yeah. he doesn't catch it, then we're planning on him catching it. He's not trying to break yeah. it. If he catches it, then I can go or whoever we have possession. The other team is, is knocking it down and they're getting their wing forwards in around the front of the break. Whereas our, our wing backs aren't following them yeah. around. They get, I but but even even on the mid kicker, I, I don't think, like, you see you see the goalkeepers now and they've this massive range where, like, Jesus, if Rory Begum was kicking with that breeze, it, it'd be it'd be serious altogether. But yeah. like p- Marcus Brennan, I wouldn't say would have that range of kicking anyway. So no, no, you yeah. know. But but I'm saying even even come up with something like rather than just try and pop little balls off on, on the top of the D and little ten yards passes and where it goes back to the goalkeeper and, and teams are just funneling in. You know, kick it into an area and flood it with bodies. You have a 50 percent chance of winning it. Exactly. And if you do win it, then you're on a go forward ball. Especially with the wind. Yeah, like you'll, you'll forgive it ball. on a normal yeah. day, but with the wind, it doesn't make any sense. Darren McCurry lads played very well. Um, he got one from play. He got three frees. He got uh, two marks, I think, and he got one sideline. The sideline was sensational. Mm. In that, what's very unusual about the sideline is that he didn't rob any yards at all. He actually <laughs> kicked it from the sideline, where usually you see them coming in on the field a good bit. It's his home ground, so. You know, he's kicked those mannies a day, I'm sure. And like, I mean, he was one of the, the real bright sparks for, for Tyrone. But then again, we've seen him do it in the league before. He's, a, he's an unusual player. Mickey Hart said about him after the game. When he's confident, he's ultra confident. And on his own pitch, before his own people, he's done that many times at training. So it's just like another day. And that's one thing about McCurry. When he's confident, he's ultra confident. He walks around with his chest stuck out. Yeah. And like, I mean, he just looks like he's totally confident. But I've seen him miss easy, easy chances in pressures, in pressure situations. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that. But I haven't really seen him have a performance like that where it was dirty. Like, you know, he had to get stuck in. He had to win some awful ball. Yeah. And he did. He looked stronger. He, he did look more confident, like even more confident than normal. Like I've seen him play well in the league before and I'm always very quick to like not get carried away with him because you can get too excited. But that was just a little bit different to what I've seen in the past. Yeah, maybe it was. By the way, what were you doing in 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 Navin? Were you hoping Mayo would win, or or what brought you there? Did you have a Mayo jersey on you? No, I didn't have a Mayo jersey <laughs> on me at all. I was I was um, just the late game was called off, so um, I no. I, you should have taken a shower coming out of Park Talton, no? No, I was I I I wasn't shouting for anyone. In, in <laughs> fairness, um, but. Ah, look, it just you just you went and look, and and you're going to see, um, you know what's, what you know what's happening out there. Who's who's doing well, who's not, and and seeing. Now it was exciting last fifteen minutes. Yeah, um, but you're not enjoying Mead's Mead's struggles in Division One at all. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, I I don't really have an opinion on it to be honest with you, <laughs> but I'd say at this stage, look, it's 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 been a tough ask for them. But like, listen, I I have I have huge admiration for what they've done. Like I've been in a situation where we've managed a team and we've, you know, you've kicked on up through a couple of divisions, and it's great when you get that momentum. But um, like, all the top teams in Division One have huge firepower going forward. Me just lack that. Yeah. They they don't have it. They've some really good players, good positions like Donald Keoghan is you know, he's he's a fantastic footballer. Menton's doing really well. Ronan Jones is coming back from America at the minute and he's coming home in March, he'd be, you know, big addition. But they just don't have that firepower up front. Yeah. Um the meat goal the meant the the McEntee goal was a beautiful goal between br- Keoghan to him, yeah. back back to him again. That's like training ground stuff, isn't yeah. it? It's just beautiful. Um, Stephen Campbell lads uh, scored two points in the first half when they were badly needed two great points he's out centre half forward um, for me he's not an inside forward he's a big strong out or half forward I think his best year for Armagh was maybe when were they beaten by Donegal in the quarter final in 14 he had a brilliant mm. year that year he was number 14 came out to midfield breaking forward whenever I see him playing well He's playing in the half forward line, driving at teams. He's a big, strong fella, and he can score from f- from distance. I think centre half forward is probably his best position. And I know the, that Armagh have an embarrassment of riches, 
but I think you should build your forward line uh, potentially around him at 11. He's a, he's a different prospect to Rory Grugan. I'm not saying I wouldn't have Grugan on it, but there's room for two different types of players in that half forward line. Mm. Yeah. Remember Stephen McDonald told us years ago about the Armagh forwards? They actually have this set of forwards now that I don't even know like if you, if you need them as you say like they've just got so much different variations and they can play in so many different types of ways it's like if you're going to play football manager you would pick our mag you'd be so excited at what you can do with them yeah they have they've, plenty, they've so many forwards what about o- Oshin O'Neill uh, Stephen Campbell Rory Grugan or Campbell and Grugan sh- changing places then the full forward line Jamie Clark Rian O'Neill and Andrew Mernon yeah. That's some forward line lads. It, it is, really it is. is. Now Young Turbot doesn't get on that, and O'Don or your man that came on, um, O'Donnell, I think his name yeah. is as well. He played a couple of years it, ago. He's yeah. a very good forward. They they have serious firepower up front. Um, but look, it's it's you know it was a great win for them against Kildare. Um, as I said last week, I like what I like what Giza does with them. Um, I think I think they're a very honest bunch and and they're working very hard. Um, progression for me would. I think when when you speak of the quality they have there, like it's it, there's no doubt in Clark, the two O'Neill, Doreen and Ushin, um, Stephen Campbell, um, I, I will think they they'd get promoted to Division One. What did you think of Jamie Clark sending off lads? Because for me, it seemed to be like he was got a second yellow for it looked like he stuck his put his arm his arm into the Kildare centre half back Ryan's face, but he was just kind of. Do you know when a, re- a, a back goes to tackle you and you might go to put his hand down away from tackling you? As he put his hand down, he caught him on, he caught him on the nose. The Kildare player didn't make much of a big deal out of it, but he got a second yellow. I just, I just thought, usually if you're going to... if It, it wasn't an elbow because his arm was dead yeah. straight. Do you know what I mean? It can be very unlucky. Um, I think, look, it had no bearing on the game. Armagh were convincing winners. And to be fair, Kildare will be very embarrassed with that result because you look down to their team and it was a very strong team they had out like I mean it's not like they're they're very you know under strength or anything Kildare Jack O'Connor will be pissed off it didn't have any bearing on the game but at the same time I, I thought it was a little bit harsh yeah like uh, we need to protect players you know when you don't want people getting hit in the head or whatever but people are going to get hit as well and there's going to be hands and you know there's going to be loose body parts that connect with the other body so we have yeah, to sort of have some sort of sport, yeah. discretion they, they know if somebody meant it or if it's dangerous or not yeah no I thought that was harsh the only thing you'd say is, is Clark's not that type of player you no. know so you'd never like but but you know at the end of the day if it, if, it, if his hand is high and it's in his face well then you know the letter of the law is referees are going to give that as a yellow card might give it as yeah it was only a yellow it wasn't a straight red last one lads is Sean Bugler he got three points from play showed great determination for actually getting the assist for McManaman's goal when it bounced it was him that was attacking that it was a weird one with Bugler like I mean he's shown great promise like we know he's on the up and maybe maybe Desi knows that he's on the up and I was just confused as to why the likes of Dan O'Brien, the likes of Dara Mullen, were getting starts in the forwards, and he's not getting a, he's not getting a start. Yeah, because he was lord in, in the Sigerson Cup as well. Right. You know, when like, he comes on, scores two points, big big points for them. Like, I, I would have thought, like when you look at the, the Dublin team that went out, Flatman was there, Mullen. O'Brien, like they should have been. Well, the flat man plays corner, but he's yeah. a back. No, yeah. sorry, but I mean, like you're, they're, they're making room for these players now. Yeah, yeah. Going forward, and I'm sure they will throughout the next few weeks. But he is one that they need to give a proper chance to. Maybe Desi's given lads enough rope to hang themselves. Is that what you, you do, see? Colin, with some lads? <laughs> where, where there's a bit of giving out around the county about this lad here. Look, we'll give these lads the enough start now, so that I'll be able to rule them out in two games. Time. You're trying to get me into trouble here, <laughs> Brian Lacey, all the me, all the county of Mead, right? And now there's fat look. For me, I, I think um, you know it was a flat performance by by um, Dublin. As I said, you don't know what's going on in terms of what they're doing around the team setup, who he's looking for, who he's not looking for. It's yeah. just unusual for us to see them as bad as they were. Um, you know, as I said you watch this space. Um, yeah. it'd be a brave man to call them there not to be in the in the mix. With all, with all the fundamentals of intensity and work rate and all those things that you just take for granted from Dublin, mm. they didn't seem to be there. Last but not by no means least Shane McGuigan uh Conan. He got seven points, uh six from play. Outstanding stuff out of ten. So like a very low scoring game, ten six, but he's getting six from play. That's kind of unusual because Tipperary didn't score from play. <laughs> didn't get yeah. one point from play. Tipperary under David Power have been a huge letdown so far. Like there's no doubt about that. They had two men sent off. They had no point from play. Their six points came from freeze. Shane McGuigan got seven against Down as well. Three from play that day. And he came on as a sub against Leitrim and scored one one off the bench. 
like this like we, we know this lad's very very talented and he's a sensational left foot but it's amazing maybe again maybe it's just the system that Rory plays that he just everything's going to be built around him he has to perform <laughs> Derry seemed to be offensively better last year, didn't they? Seemed to be getting more scores. They, now I know they're down the division and they can through. In the league final, they played well with against yeah, Leitrim. Yeah, but they played well because Shane McGuigan. <laughs> like I, I remember thinking everyone was talking about how Derry looked just looked a level above Leitrim. Maybe they did, but Shane McGuigan was a difference that day. He got the ball and put it over, and a lot of the times he was doing it from forty meters out. Do you know, it just looked easier for Derry because they had him. Yeah, you know, and that, that's sort of what it's going to be against him. He's a great talent, though, Shane McGuigan. Yeah, he is like, I mean, he's a very good, very, but, very, very tasty player. But I seen Tipperary last Sunday, and it was a pale shadow of the Tipperary team that that you know we associate with the Tipperary team in the last three or four years. So, you know, again last Sunday they 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 were poor. Like I was expecting an awful lot more. So, you know, for them not to score from play again this week probably confirms that. You know, they're probably not as, as the force that you wear. Yeah, exactly. Right, performance of the weekend goes to Shane Walsh, lads, because look, it's just a breath of fresh air to see this fella playing football now yeah. instead of the kind of straight jacket of Shane Walsh. And that's, there's, no, there's, there's no shame in anybody saying that... Because Ke- everybody say, oh, be careful what you wish for. Kevin Walsh has them competitive. And the criti- critique of Kevin Walsh was, no, no. He's getting them to a point, but they're not expressing themselves. They're not getting the best out of their best players. And I thought that was very obvious analysis. Yes, there'd be some pushback from certain people about it. No, they're, they're shoring up their defence. There doesn't look to be too much wrong with their defence now mm. when they all, they're all responsible for a man, but they're still able to express themselves going forward. And Shane Walsh, instead of looking like a scared player out in the field, now yeah. looks like a player who just can't wait to get out into the field. For me, these defensive systems are a load of nonsense. Re- and you say the same thing about Tyrone. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, uh, let your forward, let your players go and express themselves at Gaelic football. Like, they, like, like for me, it's still down to, like, two max, like, like your corner back max the corner forward, your full back, like, your defenders do your job. And then the natural pattern of playing out the way teams are playing, you're all going to end up in a defensive position anyway. Some of the time, yeah. yeah. It's, it's what you do going forward. But for me, under, under Kevin Walsh, Galway never really, you, you're never saying, look, at Galway have a chance they'd get so far but you were saying listen they're not going to trouble teams during the summer I think now on the poor choice you know you're not saying they're going to win in All-Ireland but um, if they keep progressing if on an upward curve the way they're going there's a lot of teams will not like to play them deeper down the summer yeah definitely not they won't win it might not win an All-Ireland this year they'll win it in three years I'm yeah. saying it here now Conor well, why not That's my second like, yeah, prediction I'm, I'm back it's more realistic now like, you know, <laughs> why not and it's funny I thought you had Shane Walsh overrated I actually thought you were talking him up too much I really? thought he was too inconsistent but he didn't have any attackers to play with yeah. <laughs> before, but now yeah. he, he's got all these bodies around him. And I know he's, he's, I'd, be, I'd be in Wally's corner. Oh, no, he's brilliant. For, for me, he's, he's, he's one of the best out there. And yeah. we're seeing that now. Yeah. Imagine if he'd gone forward and he, if you, when you're a forward and you've no options around you, like a Johnny Heaney bursting past you or a, di- or a coma running on ahead of you, you've no choice. You'll take him on. You'll see another lad coming across to cover mm. you saying, my route there is gone. And you go f- fist past it back out around the 45 and yeah. then it goes all around the house. That's Gaelic football if you want to play that system. Mm-hmm. If you want to play a system with enough forwards up there that forwards can have interplay. Forwards can do it together. Yep. Give mm-hmm. it down to them and let them do it. That's always been the way. Instead it is nonsense. Nonsense mm-hmm. of them getting it and having to turn around and send it back out from where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, or shoot on. from wild angles and then we're in here on a Monday going, oh, Shane Walsh had another bad game. Ah, stop. Listen, and everybody said it. Uh, like, everybody said it. Oh, look, well, Kevin Walsh and all the, trying to defend that type of football when it's blatantly obvious that the forwards they had were not were not yeah. able to play the way they should play. But it's who you surround yourself with. Like, as I said, you Kevin Joyce and uh, uh, Porrick Joyce and, and Divley are in there now and they seem to have have a similar philosophy in how the game is played. And these are fellas, now I know Kevin Walsh did as well, these are guys that have come true a system winning all Ireland's where, like Galway had, you know, Porrick Joyce, Ja Fallon, Michael Donnellan, they had real expressive footballers and they always have. And I think Joyce now has liberated these guys and he's saying, right, go and do your stuff. Yeah. And the difference in them and, and most other forward units, you're right in what you're saying, but these guys have, have the tools to go and get it done. They can score, they're big, they're strong. You know they make they, they make the right decisions and and um, it's a it's a lot easier t- to deal with those type of guys than say the likes of 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 a Mead or Mayo who were really 
struggling yeah. yesterday in the forward divisions. Yeah, no, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Right, that's a bumper show today, lads. If you're still listening to this point of the show, congratulations. That must be about an hour and a half today. Right, that's it. That's always time for. Not sure if there's going to other. There might be a show on Thursday. There's going to be three matches next weekend with the. I wasn't going to do a show next uh, Thursday, but we'll probably do one now that there's these deferred games. Um, yeah, so we'll talk to you then. Good luck. Yeah.